study today is dealing with the subject of Revelation's Lake of Fire. Now we're talking about Bible prophecy and there's a lot of misunderstandings on this subject. Actually what I'm going to share with you is good news. Of all the things I've presented, I know you might find this hard to imagine, but this is my favorite subject because when I understood the truth about this subject, it did a lot to help me love God and trust Him. And you'll see why as we proceed. Lowest place on the planet is the area around the Dead Sea. It's uh, actually about 1,312 feet below sea level. It is the basement of the planet, you might say. And uh, it's a very interesting piece of geography. It's basically a sinkhole for all of the salts and things that come down through the whole Jordan Valley. They settle there. Matter of fact, uh, if you go out into the water around the uh, Dead Sea, the salt content is so high that uh, you can float. Anybody that can't swim can float. Vespian, the Roman emperor, had heard that one time he wanted to test it. So he went down to the Dead Sea and they tied up a slave and threw him in. Sure enough, he bobbed to the surface. And they say, I've, I've been to the Dead Sea, but I didn't get in the water. But I've heard it was too cold, believe it or not, that day. But I've heard that uh, people sit out there with the newspapers and read. No recliner. I see people nodding that they've been there. Just amazing. Someone once wondered how deep it was because it is the lowest place on earth and it's a part of a deep rift. It was formed by some kind of seismic activity, the Great Jordan Valley Rift. And uh, so a lieutenant or a Captain Lynch from the U.S. Navy went out there with some special uh, gear and they sounded it and they found out that the lake, which is about 50 miles long by almost 10 miles wide, that it does have a hole. They wonder why nothing ever runs out of the Dead Sea and they thought there was a big hole in the bottle, bottom where everything's just getting sucked down. But in reality it is so big that it's simply the evaporation of the Jordan River that runs in. It evaporates faster than the water comes in. Matter of fact, the level of the Dead Sea has been going down for several years now. One of the many parts of the world where they're having a drought. Just south of the Dead Sea They've got a very interesting piece of geography. And it's believed this is the area where Sodom and Gomorrah were located. Found in the ground, and you see someone pointing. A friend of mine was down there. He gave me his pictures. He's actually given me a lot of these sulfur balls. Embedded in the, the ash and rock in these hills are these round sulfur balls. And I, sometimes I bring them with me and I demonstrate it in my meetings because it's very amazing. You just take a match put it to these yellow sulfur balls, they ignite. It's the only place on the planet that you find them. And it traces back to the store. Oh, I've got a picture of one, took a picture of one burning here. You see the little blue spot? It's, it's actually burning. You just put a match to it and it stinks terrible. That's one reason I don't illustrate that. I did that one time and everyone wanted to run out of the room. It smells like rotten eggs. But a uh, very unique place on the planet where you find these. And you know, the Bible tells us that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. They were very wicked. It says in Genesis 13, 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked, sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And God finally sent two angels to rescue Lot and his family that were there. And they warned them that they had to flee. These angels came to the city of Sodom where Lot had, he made a mistake by uh, living in this environment, but God wanted to spare him. And uh, the angel said to him, escape for your life, lest you be consumed. Consumed. Well, Lot had family in the city, so he went to try to persuade his sons-in-law and his other daughters to leave with him. And he said, get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. We've been warned. But it says that they seemed to him as one that mocked unto his son-in-law. Oh, dad, he's a religious fanatic. And so they would not, uh, would not listen to him. Then you read about it in Genesis 19, 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham saw from the distance. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. It was consumed. Now in the Bible it tells us that Sodom and Gomorrah are given to us as an example of how God is going to deal with the world in the last days. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, Matthew chapter 24, as it was in the days 
of not only Noah, but the days of Lot. So will it also be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And conditions in this world today are very much like conditions were back in the days of Lot, friends. Almost a rampant, unrestrained immorality has been endorsed by the culture. There's only so much God can take. Now we're gonna find out about what God is going to do and how he describes the punishment of the wicked in the Bible. Question number one. How many, oh, I didn't read the question yet. How many lost souls are being punished in hell today? This is very important. Second Peter chapter two, verse nine. The Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. So are the unjust punished before or after the day of judgment? They are reserved in their graves until the day of judgment. Has the great judgment day arrived yet? No. Then are they being punished yet? They're being reserved. Any of you ever gone to a nice restaurant where you gotta get a reservation? Probably wasn't Hungry Jack, right? You go to a nice restaurant, you get a reservation. You get there, you give them your name, they hold your table for you, right? Well, there is a place that God has reserved. There is a time that is reserved for the judgment of the wicked. It hasn't happened yet. A lot of ideas about hell have come from Greek mythology. They're not in the Bible. I want you to base your understanding on what the Bible says. So many in the Christian world today sort of have a, a stew. They've got this uh, potluck in their minds of, of ideas about how God punishes the wicked. He's very just in the way he does it, and he's very clear about not only how it's done, but when it's done. Again, Christ said, I trust you believe Jesus, the word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. They are judged by the word of God in the last day. That's why I'm preaching to you from the word of God. It is the ultimate criteria for that judgment. Question number two, when will sinners be cast into what the Bible calls hellfire? Well, he tells a parable, Jesus, about a farmer that sows good seed in his field, and while they were sleeping, an enemy who wanted to destroy his crop, he came and he spread tares. Tares is a, it's a Hebrew weed. He spread these weeds out among the good wheat. And um, his servant said, look, somebody sowed some tares among the wheat. Shall we go and pull up the tares? He said, no, the roots are kind of mixed up together. You'll destroy the crop if you do that. Let them grow together. The tares don't get very high. The wheat grows taller. When that uh, harvest time comes, we'll separate the two. Notice the separation doesn't happen until the harvest time. Jesus describing this parable to his disciples later made it very clear. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man will send forth his, wait a second, when? The end of the world. Got that? The Son of Man shall send his angels, and they will gather to them those who do iniquity, and will cast them into a furnace of fire. When are they cast into this furnace of fire? End of the world. So how many people are burning in hell right now? We learned in our study last night on death, what are the dead doing now? Sleeping. Now, we realize we live in this dimension of time. So when a righteous or even a wicked person dies, the next thing they're aware of is either the first or the second resurrection. Talking about that more in our study tomorrow. I hope you come for that presentation on the millennium. Number three, where are sinners who have died now? A lot of scriptures, friend. It says, the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice. Is coming, future tense. They'll hear his voice, all. Two different groups. It says the wicked are reserved to the day of destruction. There is a day, they're reserved in the grave when they'll finally be judged. And again it says, yet he will be brought to the grave and will remain in the tomb. So when a wicked person dies, where do they stay? Where do they wait? Brought to the grave, reserved, remains, waits in the tomb for that coming day of judgment. There's a resurrection for the just, there's a resurrection called the resurrection of damnation, a resurrection for the lost, or the ungodly. Question number four, what is the end result of sin? Now this is the main thing I want you to understand in this presentation. Not only are there no people burning in the lake of fire yet, 
But the lake of fire is not eternal. People are punished. There is hellfire. You all hear me? I believe that. Some people say, Pastor Doug doesn't believe in hellfire. Yes, I do. The Bible does not teach it burns through endless ages. What did Jesus say the penalty for sin is? Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And again, Christ tells us his two choices. You know the uh, beautiful verse, For God so loves the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You all have two choices. I have two choices. Life or perish. Now what does perish mean? It means the absence of life. It means death. This idea that God tortures the objects of his creation through endless ages has come from Greek mythology. And I'll tell you, some pastors, they wax pretty eloquent as they describe it, trying to mobilize people through fear. Is fear the right reason to serve the Lord? You know, I remember reading some of the sermons, excerpts from some of the, uh, the Victorian preachers as they would wax eloquent talking about hell. And they describe how these lost people were plunged by the Lord down into this molten fire and brimstone. And as they tried to swim, blistering towards the surface, choking and hailing this molten material, that they come up coughing and gasping the gases and they'd scream to the Lord, how long? And he'd say, you've only just begun, you've got eternity. And he'd push them back under again and writhing and shrieking in agony. Can you imagine that? That's what a lot of people believe. Now, I want to appeal to your good sense of reason. Would you do that to your dog? If you had a bad dog, disobedient dog, rebellious dog, and you finally said, I, I'm going to kill that dog, <laughs> would you keep on killing him? <laughs> no. No, I mean, I remember when I lived up in the mountains one day, uh, my cat, I had a cat that uh, he kind of would bring home some of the local critters. And um, for all different sizes, he was quite a hunter. He'd bring home big old squirrels and like to eat them on my sleeping bag. One day I was cooking dinner and he had caught a mouse. But you know, cats are a little bit sadistic. They don't just like kill their prey. They like to play with their food while it's alive. And so uh, this kangaroo rat, cute little thing, long fluffy tail and kind of hopped around. and. Uh, he brought this rat, I guess he wanted to show me, he dropped it down while I'm cooking. I have a fire going, I'm cooking my dinner. And he's batting the thing around, it would run, he'd pounce on it, he'd bat it, and it was days, and it would make another run for its escape. And you know what it did. In its hopping to run away, it hopped, not into my food, but into the fire. <laughs> and listen to your reaction. Oh, a poor mouse, rat. Poor little rat. It was terrible though, you know, I, I, I couldn't do anything. It, it jumped in there and it, it writhed and shrieked and it only took a few moments and it died. But you know what, to me, it seemed like an eternity just watching that poor thing suffer like that for a few moments in the fire. Am I more loving than God? Am I more loving with a rat than God is towards creatures made in his image? wayward children, rebellious children. This idea that God tortures people for the sins of one lifetime, for billions of years, think about it, a billion years burning. And you know what? A billion years after you've burned, minute by minute, second by second, you've only just begun. Isn't that right? I mean, what is eternal? The way that it's interpreted by some people. Loving God. No wonder people have turned away from the concept of God being a God of love. A lot of great people, intelligent people, have been turned off. I didn't understand this subject, and I didn't like God very much. When I went to Catholic school, and they talked to me about the ever-burning hell, and I even visited some Baptist churches. My dad was a Baptist before he turned away from the Lord. And again, fire and brimstone, ever-burning hell. And it was just fear. It was all fear. And I thought that God was a sadist. When I learned what the Bible really teaches on this subject, wow, it was liberating to me. By the way, I don't know if you surf the internet at all. You might jot down helltruth.com. 
Sim two simple words, helltruth.com. A lot of good information on this subject there. All you gotta do is remember that. You just type in Hell Truth in Google or Yahoo, you'll find it. A lot of Bible resources there. The penalty for sin is what? It's death. The wages for sin is death, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life. First lie the devil told Eve is you'll not really die. You're immortal. You'll live forever in heaven or you'll live forever in hell. It's a lie of the devil. Eternal life is given to those that believe. And yet the devil says, no, you got eternal life. It's just where? And how many, you've probably heard some people portray hell as hell is a party. Yeah, it's just, it's sort of kind of like a rock and roll party. Heaven's boring, you're just up there playing harps. It's going to be more exciting than hell. I've heard all kinds of distorted ideas about this. That's why you better get your information from the Bible. There is a lake of fire, and there is a punishment, but it's not what most people think. A few more verses. He said, lest God said Adam was evicted from the Garden of Eden, lest he reach forth with his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God said he was kicked out of the garden, so he would not be an immortal sinner. Sinners do not get immortality, body or soul. I'm going to give you more verses that make it very plain. What was the penalty for sin? Death. Penalty for sin is what? Death. How many of you believe Jesus took our penalty? If the penalty for sin is burning forever and ever in a lake of fire, then did Jesus burn forever and ever? No, the penalty for sin is death. If the penalty for sin is burning forever and ever, then he didn't pay your penalty. But he did pay the full price because the penalty is death. Does that make sense? See why it's important to understand this? Just the whole judicial understanding of salvation hinges on this question. Number five, what will happen to the wicked in hellfire? We want to understand this. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Not be. It's just not in existence anymore. Psalm 37, verse 10. The wicked will perish. Into smoke they will consume away. Look at how plain this language is. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 3. Behold, the day is coming that will burn as an oven, and all that do wickedly, all the proud, shall be stubble. You know what stubble is? When you harvest a field of rice or corn, all that's left after you've cut down that which is good is the stubble, a little stalk sticking up in the roots. Not only does it say the, the stubbles burn up, it says the day that comes will burn them up. Root and branch is burn up. Look at the language. Consume, perish, destroy, burnt up, be no more. Uh, what definition will you accept if you don't accept terms like that? I mean, how much more clear can God make it? It says, you'll tread down the wicked for their ashes under the soles of your feet. They're burnt up so there's nothing left but ashes. Now, not far from uh, Mount Vesuvius, they discovered the ruins of Pompeii. You've probably heard about this ancient Roman, Roman city. It was something like the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire. And I've actually been there. And when that volcano erupted in 78 AD, uh, it just rained down brimstone and hot ash and gases on the city and basically buried anybody that was in the city and they were all annihilated. Some managed to escape before they were hit by this, uh, what I call a cyroplastic cloud of heat and ash that just burned the lungs and killed the people in the city. They got away by sea and they reported on it. You can even read about that in Pliny's his history. Little amazing fact, it's not really related, but it's interesting. The Roman legion that was working under uh, Titus, the general and later the emperor of Rome, that were responsible for destroying Jerusalem in 70 AD and destroying the temple and burning the city, they finally got their year of vacation and they were vacationing in, the very legion that had destroyed Jerusalem was vacationing in Pompeii when the volcano erupted. It's just an interesting piece of justice from history. And all over the city, I know it's not very pretty, they found the ruins of all these people that basically were just frozen in position by the ash. And it's a kind of a, a grisly thing and it's very sobering to walk among the ruins of Pompeii. Some of you maybe have been there before and see this whole civilization that was basically frozen in time and all these people that perished. Something like a modern example of what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Turn the city to ash. 
Revelation 21 verse 8, speaking of the wicked, it says, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Is there hellfire? Yes. Is there a lake of fire? Yes. Does it burn forever? No. Do the wicked go to that lake of fire? Yes. Where is that lake of fire going to be? Is it, uh, you know, people die and you go down to a cavern down there, there's, you know, we know that there's molten fire. Even back in Bible times when they saw volcanoes erupting molten lava, they believed that down under there was fire and they said that was the headquarters of the devil. I remember reading one of these crazy supermarket magazines, you know, they have some of these really ridiculous titles on them. And uh, I didn't buy it, but you probably read them too if you're checking out in the market and you see it there. And it said, Russian well drillers go too deep and they reach hell, demons begin to escape. <laughs> Something like that. It was worded better than that. It was very interesting. So where is hell going to burn? Is it down yonder somewhere? Or is it going to be right here in Sydney? It's going to be on the surface of the earth. That's where the lake of fire is. We'll get, I'm getting ahead of myself now. It says, which is the second death? Now, people will die the first death when they just get old and die or get sick and die or have an accident and die. But the wicked are resurrected and then judged and they die what death? Second death. And that's the death for which there is no resurrection. As I said to you before, if you're only born once, you'll die twice. You need to be born again. If you're born twice, you only die once. Got that? Number six. When, where, and how will hellfire be kindled? Matthew chapter 13, verse 40 to 42. So shall it be in the end of the world, the Son of Man will cast them into a furnace of fire. It's in the future, at the end, after the wicked are judged, they're cast into a furnace of fire. Revelation chapter 20. We'll talk, the, this is really part one of tomorrow night, so I want you to make sure and get the second part of this. They went up on the breadth of the earth and they compassed the camp of the saints about. They surround the new Jerusalem, the beloved city, and the devil tries to launch this one final desperate attack on the city and people of God at the very end. They are judged and it says, fire comes down from God out of heaven and it gives them a blister. Is that what it says? It devours them. Do you know what devour means? Absolutely. If you invite me over for good Mexican food, I'll show you. But I haven't seen too many Mexican restaurants in uh, Sydney. Someone told me, I don't have any Mexican restaurants here. You got a few Hispanic. I saw one Hispanic restaurant, but not too many Mexican restaurants. I like Mexican food. And, uh, you know, California, it's really northern Mexico. And, and so uh, we eat uh, a lot of Mexican food there. But uh, devoured, all gone. That's what it means when I have Mexican food, it's all gone. It says, and the righteous shall be recomp recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. So the righteous inherit an earth made new. The wicked and the sinner are recompensed or rewarded in the earth too. This lake of fire is right here on the surface of the earth. Devil doesn't have headquarters down underneath somewhere. Number seven, how big and how hot will be this hellfire? It says here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. You know, back uh, when the atomic weapons were released on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they found out that even rocks will burn. This whole world is going to be purified. Fire is not only a bad thing, fire can be a good thing. Fire can burn and destroy and fire also sterilizes. Fire is a purging agent. It purifies. That's why the Lord brought the children of Israel out into a desert to kind of clean them up. He had to bring me out into a desert too when I found the Lord. You learn things out there in the desert. It's very hot. Things get sterilized out there. And uh, you've probably seen in your country I know you experienced some record-breaking fires in Northern California. This is a photograph of some fires that we had up here. And not too long ago, 
we had some big fires ravaging Northern California and not far from where our family has a little cabin up in the hills there. And, and I'm a pilot. I've got a little plane. And, and I almost hesitate telling people that because folks have this idea of televangelists with their jets. It's not a jet, friends. It's a little bitty propeller out front. <laughs> and it's that propeller's out there to keep me cool. <laughs> because if it stops spinning, I start to sweat. <laughs> so I was flying one time, and they had these terrible forest fires. I had to fly around it, and it looked like a nuclear explosion had gone, a big mushroom cloud. And, and I thought to myself, wow, this is just one little isolated fire. And uh, what will it be like when the earth is on fire? All the earth. God's going to purify the planet. Now, you don't need to worry about that if you're saved, because he evacuates his children from the planet when he comes. You remember we learned that we are caught up. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place, and I will come again, receive you unto myself. Now, where I am there, ye may be also. We're caught up to meet the Lord when he comes. And so we don't need to be worried. This is actually a picture of the sun having a major solar flare, but that's probably what the planet's going to look like when it's uh, being dissolved with fervent heat. It says that death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now the word Hades here comes from, uh, it, it's the Greek word, it means the grave. How could hell be cast into hell? That wouldn't make any sense. It means death and the grave are cast into the lake of fire. There's no more death, which is an enemy. God doesn't want death. God doesn't want the grave. Death and the grave are destroyed. So there's only life, no pain. And anyone who's not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. <clears throat> Friends, there's really two choices. New bodies, everlasting life, or, and by the way, you've also got two choices. Either Jesus takes your sin and you accept his sacrifice in your behalf and you live a new life and get a new heart, or you then will be judged for your sin. Not only do I not want to lose heaven, I don't want to pay for what I've done. I don't want to see it paid for twice. Jesus has already suffered for what I've done. It'd be a shame for me to also suffer for it, wouldn't it? Isn't the Bible clear every man is rewarded according to his works? Isn't the Bible clear that Jesus paid for our sin? What a shame that Jesus has paid for your sin. If you don't believe and accept that and get the new heart, you're going to pay again. That's what it says. Ah, nobody's stopping me. It's biblical. Number eight, how long will the wicked suffer in the fires of hell? This is where I really want to nail a point down. Jesus said, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. Now, if, according to the popular myth, you're saved, you go to heaven, you're lost, you go to hell, and you burn there through eternity. If everybody burns through eternity, then everybody gets the same duration, don't they? Jesus said people get different rewards. That would mean that Adolf Hitler, who I'm assuming he's lost. Hope that doesn't offend anybody. <laughs> but that would mean that Adolf Hitler, he's going to burn the same amount of time responsible for millions of death, maniacal evil man. He's going to burn the same amount of time as some poor lost teenager that commits suicide. Does that sound just? Both get everlasting torture? Jesus said everyone is rewarded according to what he deserves. There's varying degrees of rewards, varying degrees of punishment. And he'll reward every man according to his works. Another verse that illustrates this in Luke chapter 12, verse 47, 48. That servant that knew his Lord's will and neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. So one who knows and does not obey, he's beaten with many. Those who don't know, they're beaten with few, Jesus said, varying degrees. Fear not them that kill the body and are not able to kill the soul. I see that, Pastor Doug? The soul lives on. No, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, fear him who destroys soul and body in hell. Number nine, will the fires of hell eventually go out? Here's the point that you especially want to catch. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. The wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord will consume into smoke. They will consume away. Behold, there'll be a stubble. The fire will burn them, like that stubble in the field we talked about. Just burn up. 
It says, they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. They'll not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. There's not even a little coal. There's not even a little flame. There's no heat coming off. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth and as an example, suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal. eternal fire. Now the wicked are burnt with eternal fire. This is what messes people up. The wicked are burnt with eternal fire. Pastor Doug, there it is. They're going to burn forever and ever. Wait a second. It says Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? They were burnt with eternal fire, but they're not still burning. I don't know. I think maybe what I'm standing on here is wood covered with felt. Let's suppose that this platform, I had matches and kerosene. I won't do this in a theater, trust me. But if I were to set this on fire and we weren't to do anything to stop it, and we just watch it burn, first I'd get off of it. <laughs> this platform would burn up and it would never exist again. You might build another platform, but it's not this platform. This platform is burnt with eternal fire. That means the results of that fire are eternal. It's never going to be reassembled. It's gone forever. The results of the fires of hell are eternal. See, God is so merciful and patient, and there's even a resurrection for the righteous. There's even a resurrection for the wicked. But when the wicked go into the lake of fire, it is eternal fire. It is the second death. There is no resurrection. Does that make sense? That's what it means. They don't burn there forever and ever. And the smoke of their torment, someone's going to say, what about this verse, Pastor Doug? The smoke of their torment descends up forever and ever. Does that mean that they're tormented forever and ever? First of all, it says the smoke of their torment. Well, first of all, two things. You need to understand what they're talking about in Bible times in the context of what they're saying, and then understand the word forever the way it's used sometimes. First of all, in Texas, big state, not as big as Australia, but you can relate to this. I've heard when you drive across the outback, out in the bush, that it goes a long way. And driving along Texas is like that. You realize it's the biggest of the lower 40 states. Only thing bigger is Alaska. Every 10 miles in Texas, they had a town. Because there used to be farms, cotton farms, some kind of farm all over the country. They could grow things, but it was still pretty desolate. In every town, they had the city dump. And people would burn their trash in these 55 gallon, is before everyone was environmentally friendly. They'd burn their trash in their homes out back in a 55 gallon drum. They'd poke a few holes in the bottom so it'd get an updraft, and everyone burned their garbage. Eventually, it would fill up with ashes. They'd take it to the dump, they'd dump it out. Sometimes it was still even smoldering. And every 10 miles or so, you'd see a stream of smoke in Texas just going up forever and ever. You hear what I said? Going up forever and ever doesn't mean how long, it means how far. It went up out of sight. Like that forest fire I described, mushroom cloud went up into the stratosphere because the heat was so intense. So when it's talking about the smoke of their torment, it sends up forever and ever. You see what I'm talking about? Also, look at the way the word forever is used sometimes in the Bible. We talked about Jonah in our Bible questions tonight. Jonah, while in the belly of the great fish, chapter 2, verse 6, he prays. And he says, the earth with her bars was about me forever. He says, I was imprisoned in this fish. It was like Hades down here. It's kind of compared to death. How long was Jonah in the fish? And Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights. Probably seemed like forever. Can you imagine three days and three nights in that? Oh, man. Smelled bad, felt bad, looked bad. Little bioluminescent fish flashing, and this is a jellyfish and things in there. Three days and three nights. Well, I would probably say it was forever. Have you ever had to, uh, you know, get a tooth worked on and didn't have proper anesthetic? How long does it last? Oh, it took forever. Feels like that. So the word is used that way. Let me prove it. I'll give you three verses in the Bible. I want you to go by the Bible. When a servant decided that he loved his master, even though he was allowed to go free, but he said, I want to stay with my master, they went through a ritual, and it says, he will serve him forever. What did forever mean? Oh, until he died, the rest of his life, until he died. When Hannah brought her son Samuel to the temple, 
This is 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22. She said, I'm leaving him here to be a priest, to serve before the Lord forever. Is he still there today? No, he's dead and buried. It meant until he dies. Again, 1 Samuel 1, 28. She said he would stay there as long as he lives. So the word forever was used, and later she clarifies it means as long as he lives. So the wicked are punished varying degrees of time based on maybe different intensity, maybe different degrees of time, based on what they know, based on what their judgment is, what their sins are. How many of you agree there are varying degrees of good and evil? All sin is fatal, but there are varying degrees of sin. Jesus is clear. Matter of fact, when David sinned with Bathsheba, it's referred to as a great sin. There, you know, everyone makes mistakes, and there are varying degrees of sin. I'm not going to belabor that. I think you agree with me. So forever and ever, in the Bible, it's an expression that means until the end of the age. It means from eon. You ever heard the Greek word that's used there is the word eon. You ever heard someone say, I haven't seen them in eons. That's the same word that's used. It just means a long time. Now, what I'm sharing with you, someone says, Pastor Doug, you're sharing the, the philosophy of your particular denomination. Well, that might be, but it's also the teaching of a lot of great church reformers like William Tyndale. He believed exactly what I'm teaching you today. Martin Luther, a lot of Protestant churches were founded believing this. A famous um, Pentecostal minister named uh, William Fudge, he wrote a book called The Fire That Consumes. He told all the Pentecostals in the Assembly of God that he said, we're not going by the Bible. He says, if you go by the Bible, the lake of fire does burn up. Kind of turn them upside down theologically. And you've probably heard of, uh, oh, well, there's a lot of uh, other theologians. John Stott, he's the picture in the bottom of the picture. I just had a brain cramp, sorry. Uh, great theologian, John Stott, he believes exactly what I'm teaching you today about the punishment of the wicked. So a lot of good theologians out there understand if you're going to go by the Bible, this is what it teaches. Number 10. What is left when this fire of hell goes out? And it says, they will tread down the wicked for they are ashes under the soles of their feet. We're not going to walk out of the New Jerusalem and go, oh, ah, oh, ah, it's still burning. No, they're all burned up. They're just ashes. And on the ashes of this purified planet, then God creates a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. In the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. That's the second half of Malachi 4. It says, there'll not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before. It's burn up. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them with an overthrow, making them examples unto those who should after live ungodly. Now I read you one verse from Jude. Here's another one from Peter telling us Sodom and Gomorrah that were burnt with eternal fire. Peter says, they're overthrown as an example of what God is going to do in the last days. Very much like what happened to Pompeii. Number 11. Will a wicked enter hell in bodily form and be destroyed both soul and body? Is it physical? What does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 10. Words of Jesus. If you've got a red letter edition Bible, these words are in red. Fear not them who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Here's the rest of that verse. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I want that to sink in. I want to read it one more time. Words of Jesus. What's going to happen in hell? Destroy soul and body. If that's clear, say amen. Just humor me. I mean, I can't understand it. Well, someone says, yeah, well, the body, bodies burn up. Body goes to ashes, but the soul burns forever. Jesus said, destroy the soul and body in the hell, in the judgment. It's future. And they're annihilated there. If your eye offends thee, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where the worm doesn't die and the fire's not quenched. Okay, Pastor Doug, I was wondering if you were going to mention that verse. Wait, there it says, Doug, the worm doesn't die and the fire's not quenched. The word that Jesus uses for hell here comes from the word Gehenna. There are four words in the Bible used to describe hell. I'll get to those in just a minute. One of those four words is a Greek word, Gehenna. Gehenna is the Greek way of saying Hinnom. The Valley of Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom, is mentioned in the Bible. It was outside Jerusalem. It was a very steep valley. It was a place where the pagans 
had set up idols to their pagan gods. It was considered a cursed valley. To discourage the worship of those pagan gods, the Jews made it the city dump. Every city needs a dump. They need a landfill. And the Valley of Hinnom was the landfill. Today, it's still pretty steep, but they're starting to build on the sides because they're short of land. And they would take all their burning refuse, dead animals, rotten food, they'd throw it off in there. It stunk. It was full of maggots and it was smoldering. So when Jesus said, you're better off, he's using an illustration. Going to heaven, missing an eye or a foot or a hand. All right, stop, 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 stop. How many believe anyone in heaven is going to have a glorified body without an eye, foot, or hand? <laughs> so would we all agree Jesus is using a figure of speech here? Then to go into Gehenna, that's the exact word he used, where the worm doesn't die and the fire's not quenched. He's saying, you're better off. He said, some people say, I, I, I would like to serve the Lord, but boy, I just can't give up my cigarettes. I'd like to serve the Lord, but you know, I got this boyfriend, and I know he's not a Christian, but I sure like him. Jesus said, cut it off. It might be harder than cutting off your hand, cutting off your foot, plucking out your eye. There's struggles in taking up our cross and following Jesus. Sometimes that struggles. Can you imagine plucking out your eye or cutting off your hand? If you had to do it to save your life? I heard you got a snake out here. It's pretty lethal. Someone said, if that snake bites you, you got a couple seconds to hack off your hand. Or you're not going to live. They got a snake in Indonesia, or is it uh, Vietnam, called a two-step. Supposedly, you get bit by this snake, you get two steps. And if you knew that was the only way to live, would you make that sacrifice? This is what Jesus is talking about. And he's looking right there at the city dump when he says that. So he's just comparing all of the lost are the refuse of salvation. They refuse to accept the Lord. They're going to be consumed and burnt up. They're cast out. Doesn't mean they're going to burn forever and ever and just worms. Can you imagine trying to walk around in heaven, tiptoeing around smoldering lost people and maggots? It's not what it's talking about. It's an illustration. Listen, he will thoroughly purge his floor. He'll gather the wheat into the garner, but he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Unquenchable. Pastor Doug, there you've got it. They're burnt eternally with unquenchable fire. That means they're burning forever and ever. It's not what that means. What does unquenchable mean? I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but does anyone here have a pack of matches? I'm not going to smoke. No, well, probably better that you don't have a pack of matches. Let me just tell you what, what the illustration is here real quick. I, I've thought about stopping at the hotel and grabbing a pack and, and illustrating this. Let's suppose I light a match. Okay, use your imagination. There it is, all right. Match is burning in my hand. It's just burning down burning down, getting near my fingers. I don't want to burn my fingers. You spit on these fingers, you grab the top, turn it upside down. Now it's burning up the other direction. Top's already kind of smoldering ashes, but it's burning up. It burns, burns up. I didn't put it out. It burned with unquenchable fire. The word quench, it's a verb, it means to extinguish. Will there be any firemen running around and help putting things out? No, that's all it's talking about. The fire can't be put out. Now, let me prove what I just said to you biblically. You say, Pastor Doug, you say these things. It's in the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 27. Prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bring a burden, even entering into the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Well, they did not repent. They continued to disobey the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar came. He burnt the city. He burnt the gates with unquenchable fire. There was nobody throwing water, no fire brigade putting out the fires of Jerusalem. It was burnt with a fire that could not be extinguished. So when the Bible says the wicked are burnt with unquenchable fire, it means there are no firemen running around in hell putting out the wicked. It's unquenchable. It's going to burn them with an eternal fire. You understand the language? What it's saying? Bible example there helps to illustrate that. It says, uh, Christ will declare to the wicked, it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body should be cast into hell. And that's what's going to happen. The whole body, spirit, soul is cast into hell. He said, rather fear him who's able to destroy soul and body in hell. 
the soul that sins, it will die. How many verses do you need? By the way, there's a lot more in your lesson that we're giving tonight. Number 12. Will the devil be in charge of hellfire? Oh, do you think you can trust him? Make sure everybody gets fair shake. And people have these pictures of the devil. He's got his pitchfork. Make sure that you know all the sinners cook evenly. <laughs> is the devil in charge of hell or is he going there? It says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire in brimstone. And again, speaking about the fate of Lucifer, I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of them that behold thee. He is going to be devoured. Never shalt thou be any more. Now, if anybody deserves to burn forever, who is it? I mean, of all the people tempted around the world, and the one who tempted even the evil angels to rebel, it originates with this arch fiend called the devil. If anybody, he's worse than Hitler. If anybody deserves to burn forever, it would be him. But it says, I'll bring you to ashes. Now he burns day and night until he's all gone. We don't know how long that's going to be, but he's going to suffer the most. But even he, the Bible says, never shalt thou be. God's not going to immortalize the devil. The Lord does not have a torture chamber off there in the cosmos somewhere while you and I go on through eternity enjoying bliss. It's going to be this place where people are being tortured. Whoever's not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Does the word hell, as, I'm sorry, does the word hell as used in the Bible always refer to a place of punishment? No, and this is where people get mixed up. A lot of times when you read the word hell, I sometimes even feel guilty saying that because I don't want you to think I'm cursing. Some people use the word that way, but it's in the Bible. It's being used typically as the grave. In the Old Testament, the word sheol is translated hell. It typically just means the grave. It even says King David went to sheol. 31 times you'll find it, it just means the grave. In the New Testament, you'll find 10 times the word Hades is translated the grave, or the word Hades comes out, sometimes hell, but it just means the grave. Gehenna, 12 times, meaning a place of burning. Tartarus is only used one time, and it means a place of darkness. So you find the word 54 times in the Bible, hell. Number 14, what is God's real purpose in hellfire? He's getting even with these rebellious children, so he's going to torture them through eternity. Is that his purpose? No, sorry, I'm being sarcastic. Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. God doesn't want anybody there. He is going to destroy Satan and his minions there, but those who choose to follow the devil instead of Jesus, they share in that fate. He's rewarding the devil and his angels, but if we choose to follow them instead of Jesus, we'll share in that reward. And they go up on the breath of the earth, and they can pass about the camp of the saints, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. There you have it again. Number 15. Isn't the work of destroying sinners foreign to God's nature? Does the Lord want to take life or give life? Does the Lord like to curse or does he like to bless? Does the Lord like to see suffering? Or did Jesus suffer to take our suffering? This whole idea that God is a sadist is so opposite. It's exactly what the devil wants people to think. The devil wants people to believe this misconception about God because in their heart of hearts they say, how can I ever really love him? If, if God is going to torture, suppose you've got a loved one that's lost and you're in heaven and someone that you dearly loved, parent, spouse, child, and they didn't make it. Let's be honest, not everyone's going to make it. How could you ever feel love for God if you knew somewhere out there there was a place where he was torturing the ones you loved in this life. Unless God is going to totally make us so that we just don't even think straight and are totally unaware and oblivious. But he's going to demonstrate his love in that he's even going to put the wicked out of their misery because sinners are not happy. The way that God deals with the wicked is actually an act of love. He had a horse race a little while ago here. What do they sometimes do at horse races when a horse breaks its leg? Right there on the racetrack. I don't know if they do it here. They still do it in the States, even with all their compassion. They figured it is the most compassionate thing to do because the horse can't stand up again, especially after a certain age. 
I understand if they're under two, they might actually be able to splint them and heal them so they can breed again, but they'll never race again. Is that an act of cruelty or is it an act of mercy? mercy. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. He's brought you here because he doesn't want you to perish. He's pleading with your heart through the Holy Spirit. And I know even after these meetings are over, God speaks to you through the day. He's calling you to make a complete surrender. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and accept him and surrender to him and serve him. And you'll find peace. you find joy. He wants you to live, not die. Speaking of the destruction of the wicked, it says, The Lord shall be wroth that he might do his work, his strange work. It's strange to his nature. And bring to pass his act, his strange act. This is strange for God. It's not normal for him. It repulses him, but he has to do it. Can you imagine how a horse trainer feels when he has to walk out on the field and to dispatch a wounded animal? Do you think he enjoys that? Or does it break his heart? They do it with tears in their eyes. God is a God of love. He makes life. He delights in new life. He delights in seeing his children happy. What kind of parent is it that likes to see their children suffer? And if you have to punish your children, do you enjoy it? Something wrong with you if you do. That'll no doubt turn into abuse. And by the way, on a side note, if you ever do have to punish your children, don't do it while you're mad. Because you're not likely to be fair. Wait until you calm down, then deal with it. Amen? God says, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. And then he appeals and he says, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Again, the Son of Man has come not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus wants to save us that we might not perish. Someone might ask this question, shall mortal man be more just than God? When you think about some of these convoluted ideas that people have about the destruction and the punishment of the wicked, the idea that the Lord's going to burn people through all eternity for the sins of one brief lifetime. And if we wouldn't do that to our children, and we wouldn't do that to our dog or even a kangaroo rat, and yet people believe that God's going to do it to his rebellious children, forever and ever he's going to torture them? No. Are you more just than God? That's what Job is asking. Of course not. Number 16. What are God's post-hell plans for the earth and his people? What is God going to do? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And God says, Behold, I will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now get this, friends. There shall be no more death. Get this. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. There shall be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. If God has a torture chamber out there in the universe or down yonder somewhere in the earth where people are tortured and they're burning and writhing and screaming and crying and sorrowful, how can this verse be true? God is making a universe where there's no more sin, no more sinners, no more pain, no more suffering. All things, all things are made new. If sinners are immortalized, those verses aren't true. You see what I'm saying? If the penalty for sin is everlasting torture, then Jesus didn't pay your penalty. This is a very important teaching, friends, because not only does it liberate us in that we realize that God is just and God is fair, it helps us recognize that God is a God of love and that you can trust Him, that we're going to enter a universe where all things are made new. Yes, there is punishment for sin. There's only two choices that we have, life and death. I don't want to suffer my sins, friends. I don't want to experience in the lake of fire what I've done. I am so thankful that Jesus experienced that on the cross for me. And He experienced everything you've ever done wrong or you even may do wrong. Christ suffered for the sins of the whole world on the cross. And you might say, how can one man, he wasn't just a man. God became a man. And that's why it required God. Because only God could suffer for the whole race. 
He suffered as no one could suffer. And you know what made him suffer the most? He experienced separation from his father. He experienced that eternal separation that the lost will feel. And that's what broke his heart more than anything, why he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the cry of the lost. He took all that because he loves each one of us so much because he doesn't want us to perish. Friends, the story of hell is actually good news. It's the good news that Jesus took your hell, if you'll believe. He took your lake of fire, if you'll accept him. He wants you to live. He wants you to have a new life, but you've got to trust him. Trust him with your life. You, you can love a God who is a God of love. He's not a sadist. He's compassionate and long-suffering to us, word. And as I close this meeting with prayer, my appeal to you is, what profit is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? You're better off going to heaven, if it were even possible, missing a hand, a foot, an eye, rather than having your whole body cast into the lake of fire. Is there any sin in this life that's worth more to you than Jesus? Any sin that's more precious to you than everlasting life? Don't be fooled, friends. We serve a good God. It's infinitely better to follow Jesus. Do you believe that? Then let's ask him again. Could you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> Loving Lord, oh, it is so good that we can address you with this liberated concept knowing that you are a God of love and that you are going to create a universe where there is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. All things are new. We understand, Lord, the wicked will be destroyed. They'll perish. They'll consume. It's a second death into smoke, into ashes. Never will they be anymore. Your language is clear, Lord, that we have two choices, life and death. It's been that way from the beginning. It's still that way today. And Jesus came so that he could take our death that we deserve and give us the life that he deserves. Lord, that's a lot of love. We can't even comprehend it. But it's my prayer that everybody here, those who may be watching or listening, will all make a decision right now to accept and to choose you, to accept that love. Bless each person, Lord, in their hearts and mind. We know there's a lot going on in their lives, and I believe that you want them to hear these truths. I pray you'll bring them back again, even bring others, Lord. And ultimately, we're asking you prepare us for what's coming upon the world. Help us to serve you in the time that remains, and be ready when Jesus comes. We ask in his blessed name. Amen.